Well, welcome to the um, IS Distinguished Lecture given today by Professor James ha uh, Haber. And I'm very delighted to welcome him. Uh, this lecture actually is also the first of our uh, the Life Science Division Seminar Series, which is also the Life Science 6410 course. I can see that you know that you're coming for a treat by the number of, the, of you that show up. Okay, so I'm particularly happy that Professor Jim Habers, the title of his talk is Why Study Cancer by Studying Yeast Cells? As you know, some of you may know that I work on yeast, and uh, some of you may not know how important yeast is as a model system for studying uh, basic molecular mechanisms or fundamental uh, uh, cellular processes. Professor James Haber is Abraham and Etta Goodman Professor of Biology, of Biology at Brandeis University. He received his PhD in biochemistry at the University of uh, California in Berkeley and his postdoctoral training at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He is a world authority on double strand brake repair. His lab has pioneered the real-time monitoring of the repair of double-strand chromosome breaks in yeast cells by using very simple techniques, using solvent blocks, PCR, and chromatin immunoprecipitation. But his experimental design is so elegant that just using simple techniques, he actually can do this real-time monitoring um, of uh, funny sounds. Uh, of, uh, um, uh, he, his lab also uh, characterized many of the molecular steps in different mechanisms of double strand break repair by homologous recombination and non homologous end joining. His lab also investigates the DNA damage response by, by which cells arrest mitosis when cells suffer a single chromosome break. Um, he received many prestigious awards. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. I've known Jim for decades, um, maybe through yeast meetings, when the, uh, in the days when the yeast community was small and tight. I'm very happy that he's able to find time to stop by at Hong Kong UST on his way to Shanghai. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jim Haber. Well, it's, you can hear me all right? Um, as, as Vic says, I've, we've known each other a long time, and actually one of the first uh, pro projects we ever worked on on chromosome biology was based on uh, findings that Vic had made about the subtelomeric <coughs> that we studied for a long time. Um, uh, all right, so... Um, that was the title. I'm going to give you another title, just uh, as a way of thinking about what I'm going to talk about. Um, and that is that, that really one of the big problems in studying the processes of DNA metabolism is really that the molecules are, are so small that it's just impossible to think about how, how small they are. So I'm going to give you a frame of reference. So when I was a, well, I wasn't a, a, so young when this book came out. Uh, this wonderful uh, pair of inventors decided to sort of try to communicate to people um, the, the magnitudes, orders of magnitude change. And so they started with a picture of a man lying on a blanket, and then they showed what would happen at, at, at 10 meters, at 100 meters, and so forth. And of course, some of these pictures were imaginary because nobody had been to the moon. Um, this was a later edition. But the point is that, that to, if you go 10 to the 8 meters away from the Earth, you, you, can, you can see the, the Earth uh, from the moon. But then they also decided to show what happens if you go into, through the skin, into the cells. And when you finally get to 10 to the minus 8 meters, you can see DNA. Okay, what, what that means is that to see DNA requires as much magnification as it takes to see a person from the moon. And, and that's, a, that's the daunting challenge of, of doing molecular biology, is to find indirect ways of being able to visualize biological processes, which obviously you cannot see even with a 
a light microscope, and if you put them in an electron microscope, they're dead. So you need some, some other way of doing this kind of work. And I'll tell you some of the kinds of approaches that, that my lab has been through. So the other frame of reference that I'll give you uh, has to do with uh, my life. Um, I was 10 years old, so that you can figure out how old I am now. Um, uh, when I was 10 years old, uh, this was the big event of 1953. Uh, these two guys, uh, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, uh, climbed Mount Everest, and that was the big event of my 10th year. But the really big event of 1953 were these two guys. Okay? And, and in 1953, they uh, worked out uh, stealing a certain amount of data from someone named Rosalind Franklin. They worked out uh, the structure of the DNA molecule. And uh, in this tiny paper that they wrote is this wonderful sentence. So, as I say, the most famous understatement in molecular genetics. That it had not escaped our notice that the specific pairing between uh, the two strands of DNA suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. And in this first paper, they didn't say anything more. Um, but geneticists seeing this realized, or at least over time, realized that, that what the implications were. And so the idea, as I think most of you know, is that a DNA molecule is made up of these base pairs in two anti-parallel strands. Um, and, and C's always pair with G's, and A's always pair with T's. And therefore, if you can pry open the two strands of the DNA and enzymes start to add new bases, you can, you can faithfully replicate each of these strands because a, C, a, a, a G will always pair with a C, and an A will always pair with a T, or almost always. And, uh, and therefore, you can do this, uh, uh, this kind of replication. And I'm going to talk later about uh, replication processes that do this same kind of copying, which, which uh, will open up a strand of DNA and start copying it uh, for purposes not of just copying the DNA, but repairing the DNA if it has been damaged. Okay, so just uh, to continue this sort of introduction for those of you who don't live with DNA as, a, as your favorite object, uh, each of us in every cell of our body has two meters of DNA. It has to be packaged into a cell that you can't see without a microscope. Uh, so there has to be very elaborate folding of this DNA up so that you can do this. You have, um, uh, as it says here, uh, trillions of cells in your body and, and enough DNA so that the DNA in your body will stretch to the end of the solar system. Okay, so that's a lot of informational molecule. And during this time, your body has copied the DNA of the first cell, the zygote that was the beginning of you, and, and has copied it faithfully over and over and over again. And, and um, I'll say a little bit more about it. And just so we're all on the same plane at the beginning, um, as I think you all, 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 or almost all of you know, Henry, are you still here? Um, uh, the DNA molecule is made up of, of, of genes. Uh, segments of the DNA encode the information, which is turned into messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is turned into protein. And, uh, and the cells have the capacity to make all of these different proteins. But as you know, um, hemoglobin is made in red blood cells and in no other cells of the body. And whereas DNA polymerase is made in all of the cells of the body. So all of these kinds of... Uh, of, of, of genes have to be regulated, and there have to be uh, elaborate on and off switches associated with all of these genes in order to make sure that only in some cells will you make this protein, whereas in all cells you'll make this one. And, 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 and of course, uh, this has to be true for, for all the genes of the body. So um, 10 years ago, if just before human uh, or vertebrate DNA was, was finally sequenced, people used to think that in order to be the complex person that we are, to, to be a person with all the uh, organ systems and cell types that we have, there probably had to be 100 or 200,000 genes, and those were the estimates. But now, it turns out that probably the number of genes we have is fewer than 25,000. And it's the same number of genes that any other vertebrate has. Um, so, so how those 
25,000 is not a very big number. And how those genes can specify all the complex of variety of, of phenotypes that have to be manifest is, is really still the big problem in biology that no one has worked out in any detail. We know lots of the ways in which individual genes are regulated, but the developmental processes still um, to really describe how an embryo uh, turns into something as complicated as we is, is, is still one of the big problems. Now, um, for, again, for future reference, as I said, um, during this replication process, um, there's this very nice system so that, that we, you get an accurate copy. But once every 100 million times or something like that, the DNA polymerase makes a mistake. If that mistake is not corrected, then the next time the DNA molecule replicates, this A, oops, this A is going to be used as, as the template, and you're going to end up with a T here, and this will be a mutation. And as I think most of you know, um, single base pair substitutions, changes of a single base pair, um, can often result in a mutation which has serious consequences. Uh, the first mutation that was actually documented at the protein level was the change call it caused by sickle cell hemoglobin, which is a change of a single base pair that changes one amino acid to a different amino acid. And, and most, me, most mutations that we talk about, most allele variations that distinguish one individual from another, are these kinds of single nucleotide polymorphisms that, that have arisen spontaneously during the process of DNA copying. And they are very rare events, but we, as I say, we have so many cells in our body that, that they, they show up. Now, as I said, um, all vertebrates have about the same number of genes, but there are lots of reasons why you want to study processes invasively where you can't do this with people. Obviously, you uh, I mean, for example, there are lots of interesting genetic questions, but we are not allowed to tell this woman and that man to breed and have 27 children so that we can look at their offspring and figure out the genetic rules. So the strategy, therefore, is to work on simpler organisms where you can do this and nobody objects to the fact that you are going to slaughter uh, several hundred billion yeast cells. Nobody, uh, the, the people for the ethical treatment of animals is unconcerned that we do this uh, with yeast. So many people work on fruit flies and on, and on the worms in the is elegans because they're multicellular organisms. They have lots of behavior, which obviously simple organisms like this do not have. But for studying basic eukaryotic molecular biology, it still turns out that the Saccharomyces cerevisiae and a few other eukaryotic model systems have the enormous advantage that you can um, do really impressive genetics and couple it with a very uh, a good molecular biology to learn a lot about these processes. So, and, and then finally, just to sort of um, keep, keep us all um, in, 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 the, in the same frame of reference, as I said, you have two meters of DNA in every cell of your body. It's packaged in, in ways so that at least at one point in the cell cycle, um, all the chromosomes are highly condensed and are visible. And they do this by wrapping the DNA around a set of uh, core proteins called histone proteins. And there are many other proteins involved in this process, which then gets folded into more and more uh, highly organized structures until finally you have this, this uh, visible chromosome. In most of the state of the stages of the cell cycle, this, the chromosomes don't look like this. They, they're all spread out. And you can see that in this picture here. Um, and one of the really uh, remarkable advantage, uh, advances in, in cell biology was the development of uh, chromosome-specific staining techniques. This is called uh, sky karyotyping, in which by using very, uh, 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 colorimetric labeling, one can identify all of the individual chromosomes in a human um, by, by their color. And, and so this is the standard arrangement or a karyotype of a, of a female human, um, 23 pairs of chromosomes, one set from the mother, one set from the father, I think you must all know this. And, and as I say, this, this arrangement 
if you take almost any cell out of your body and put it under the microscope and do this, they all look like this. The karyotype is just incredibly stable through literally trillions of cell divisions. Okay, so then what is shocking are these cells. Um, this is cancer cell. Um, cancer cells um, don't, they, they're incredibly, excuse me, this is just, uh, they're, they're incredibly uh, uh, diverse in their, in their instability, but what is obvious about all of them is that there are these incredible changes uh, in copy numbers, so sometimes you have many copies of the same chromosome, uh, but there are also <coughs> truncations and so-called translocations, which join two segments of chromosome together, uh, and, and other rearrangements uh, that are too small to see at this level of, of analysis, uh, which have accumulated into, into these uh, cells. And, and, and so what interests me uh, is really uh, how cells can be so accurate in maintaining their karyotype, and then what happens in a very small fraction of cells that progress into cancer cells, where they have lost this, uh, this stability. And that, that's really the focus of, of the talk that I'm uh, going to give, which is going to become uh, increasingly more detailed uh, and will lose a certain number of people, I suspect, along the way. Okay. Um, some of these translocations that are shown in that previous slide are actually important in the origin of the cancer. And the most famous of these is the so-called Philadelphia chromosome, it's called that because it was found in the city of Philadelphia in, in the United States. Um, and this Philadelphia chromosome is a particular translocation which joins uh, a segment of DNA from two different chromosomes together. And in the course of this, what it does is to join a perfectly nice uh, protein kinase um, to the wrong control system. The fact that it has some of the uh, the fact that it has some, uh, a fusion in this case is not, is not terribly important. It's the fact that this particular uh, protein is now uh, doing its normal job at the wrong time. And that's, uh, that's the, the consequence of this particular translocation. And many uh, uh, of these um, uh, uh, rearrangements have that consequence of placing a perfectly nice gene under the wrong control. And here, this nice gene regulates cell growth. So it, it ought to be turned off under certain conditions. It's not, and this, this advances the ability of cells to proliferate. I should also say, however, that when we, from what we know so far, many of these translocations are just passengers. They, they are not themselves uh, probably important at all in the cancer, but some of them are. But, but what is obvious is that there is that the cell has lost its ability to maintain itself in this fine condition and, and to end up with, with, with cells that look like this. So uh, the last sort of uh, overview of, 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 of the cancer problem is, is, is that there are, um, I mean, I am simplifying a huge field to, to three rules, but very useful. Um, there are these translocations that place a gene or a part of a gene under the control of a different regulator. Then there are mutations in a set of proteins called, or genes called oncogenes, um, so that these mutations acquire new properties. Uh, for example, as it says, they're staying on when it should be off, or, or a, a famous example is the RAS protein, which is a, a regulator, again, of cell growth. Uh, which ought to be turned off by, by the way in which it adopts one protein conformation or another and it stays in the active conformation. Um, and finally, there are inactivations uh, in many different ways of so-called tumor suppressor genes, which are genes that normally regulate and prevent cells from proliferating when they should not. And, and if, if you want three rules about what cancer mutations are like, I think that's, that's a big set. Except that what you have to know also is that, um, that in order for a cell to become a cancerous cell, it has to acquire many novel properties. It isn't sufficient to just grow better. It needs the ability to, for example, induce angiogenesis so that the, that the growing tumor has a blood supply. It has, it has to uh, prevent itself from just uh, killing these cells off by, 
uh, by apoptosis and other mechanisms and so forth, so that a cancer cell acquires a very large number of alterations in, in over a course of generations. Um, and it is only after it has done that that you end up with a full blood cancer cell. And we know a lot, and I'll tell, talk a little bit about how people know um, these things, but we know a lot of the, of, of the alterations in many cancer cells, but we don't have yet a complete picture of, of what it takes for cells to progress in, into, into this situation. Okay, so the question really for the rest of this talk in a way is, I, well, not in a way, is, is how, how does this happen? And, and, and just to put it in, uh, I mean, people are interested in this, uh, my lab is definitely not the only lab interested in this uh, subject. Uh, there have been long, well, closer to 7,000 papers published in the last five years on it that have the words genome instability in the title or in the abstract. So this is a big subject, many, many people interested in this. And we think that we, by studying some aspects of this in the model system, the yeast system, that we have a way of uh, an insight into the problem that is hard to get by just looking at these kinds of events without <coughs> being able to really follow the mechanism of their, of their uh, appearance. And so, um, so what we've been trying to do is, is to analyze why cells end up in this condition. And, and the second pair of rules that I'll give you about these cancer cells is that they have lost the primary ways of preparing chromosome breaks so that they don't end up looking like this. There are alternative mechanisms of repairing chromosome breaks, which will end up just sticking to any two pieces of DNA together, which end up doing these translocations. But they have lost the primary and accurate ways of repairing double strand breaks, and or they have defects in, in, in what Vic mentioned, this process of the so-called DNA damage checkpoint, which is a mechanism that senses that cells have damage and stops cells from dividing until that damage is repaired or when that damage is not repaired, has a mechanism to eliminate those cells so that it, they do not continue to proliferate. So, for example, uh, a key protein in, in, in this checkpoint in mammalian cells is a protein called P53, a protein that is mutated in at least half of all the cancers that people have identified. So cells that, cells that have lost this ability to detect and eliminate damaged cells give those cells the opportunity to proliferate and to end up looking more and more like this. So that's, that's the, the, the broad frame of reference. Where do the breaks come from? So these, these breaks, which are going to be stuck together in these weird ways, mostly come not from smoking or from standing out in the Hong Kong sun or um, any, any other exogenous source. It comes from the process of DNA replication itself, which is extraordinarily accurate. DNA replication is accurate to the 99.999999% of the time. That's not enough nines, okay? Because there's this much DNA. And so if you look in a vertebrate cell, these happen to be chicken cells, and remove a key protein that I'm going to talk about more, a repair protein, which is necessary for the repair of chromosome breaks, what you see are a dozen uh, interruptions like this, which, some of which are marked by arrows. And what those interruptions are is that as Watson and Crick DNA are being copied, um, there is a break in one of the two sister chromatids. So that, that as the process, as Watson is being copied and Crick is being copied, something fails and you end up with a chromosome break. And it's the job of this RAD51 protein to figure out a way to use the information in the intact chromatid in order to repair the break on the broken one so that you don't end up looking like this. And so if you deplete the RAD51 protein from cells uh, in, in, in chicken cells or in human uh, cells or mouse cells, the cells in one generation, they're dead. And they're dead because they have accumulated all of these breaks. And, and the only reason that the RAD51 protein is not essential in Saccharomyces is that the Saccharomyces genome is this big. And, and, and the amount of breakage per unit length of time, DNA is the same. 
Okay, this spontaneous rate of breakage is not different in mammals or in yeast. It's just that only about 8% of yeast cells suffer a single double strand break and would be dead in the absence of RAD51, whereas all of the mammalian cells, um, vertebrate cells, have, have multiple of these breaks because just the size of the genome makes it uh, being, being great. So what we would like to do is to understand how these breaks are repaired in, in great detail. And the problem is that if you look here, um, I mean, this is just a picture of a cell, but, but if you looked at many cells that were depleted for RAD51, the location of these breaks is not fixed. There are fragile sites, sites where breaks occur more often than other sites, but the breaks are occurring in a relatively dispersed fashion. And so the, the approach that we basically started was thinking that we could, we could do better if we could create a situation in which all the cells have a chromosome break in exactly the same place, induced at exactly the same time, because then we would have a synchronous process where all the cells had to deal with the break in, in real time, in a synchronous way, and if we could watch it, and the question from the moon is, how are you going to watch it? But if you can watch it, then you ought to be able to understand how that break is being repaired. <coughs> and so um, the idea, therefore, is to do this in a simple model organism, to create a break at a specific site uh, in a synchronous fashion, to analyze what happens to the DNA uh, uh, during repair, which turns out to be relatively easy and more difficult, <coughs> is to figure out what happens when different proteins are, are either mutated or, or absent. But we and other people have figured out ways to do this, and I'm going to describe some of those, some of those ways. So it turns out that the budding yeast has an endogenous break-induced system that it uses for what is called mating type switching. Yeast cells have two sex types. I don't know which one is male and female, but one of anyway, it has two sex types, and it's determined by the expression of genes from a single locus. So this is a this protein regulates some other proteins, and these two proteins regulate other proteins. But mad alpha cells have this that, this set of sequences, and remarkably, mad A cells have a completely different sequence in the middle of this locus. And even more remarkably, these organisms, which are a class of organisms called <coughs> homophallic organisms, have the ability to switch from one mating type to the other. And and this we, we, we in the politically correct environment, we call this gender reassignment. So the idea is that the yeast cells already have a system for changing one set of DNA sequences into another. And it turns out that they do that by expressing an enor a, a, a restriction enzyme with an enormous recognition sequence. It's 24 bases long. It's actually degenerate. It, cuts, it actually can cut here as well as here. But it recognizes essentially a single location in yeast. Actually, that's not true. It recognizes this location, but it can't cut this one. And, and another story for another time is the fact that this region is made heterochromatic by modifications of the histones across this region. So, so the, the histones in this region are modified, and, and the enzyme that ought to be able to cut here because if you cut exactly the sequence, you can't cut here. So all the breakage happens at the mat locus, and the donor sequence, the template from which these sequences are going to be removed and replaced, remains unbroken. And that, that was critical for the way in which this process works. Okay, so um, Ira Herskowitz's lab uh, was one of the early labs that studied uh, aspects of this process along with, with, other, with us, and they discovered that they could take this HO enzyme and they could place it under the control of an inducible promoter. And that meant that you could turn on this break in the cells so that essentially all the cells would break at the same time. And then we um, took this system and we wanted to know in more detail how, how, how long did it take to do this repair, what kind of steps could we identify in the process, and what genes were responsible for this repair. And so, um, 
this is how we did it. Um, I, I'm assuming that some of you don't know what a southern blot is, but maybe I'm wrong. But it, anyway, this is my version of how we do this. Um, you, you start by having identifying a DNA sequence um, in, in this region, and there is a site for a restriction enzyme that cuts a specific sequence in DNA here, but it's not here because these are different DNA sequences. So this fragment and this fragment are different sizes. And if you cut the DNA into lots of pieces um, and then put them on an agarose gel and run the DNA, separating the DNA from uh, large sizes to small sizes, and then use a radioactive probe, which is specifically designed to either detect this sequence or this one, you end up with this kind of pattern. So um, this, is, this gel got me elected to the National Academy of Science. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is what we could see for the first time was that this locus here was cut into a smaller fragment. And, and then, then we could see the appearance of the product because, as I said, the size of this fragment is different from this one, so we could see when the product appeared. And at the beginning, we were absolutely shocked because we thought this would be over in minutes, but it takes over an hour. And so that means that there's a lot of time in which there are, in, as it turns out, many slow steps in the process which we could identify during, the pro during this uh, by monitoring the recombination event essentially in real time. So the, the basic strategy was just to be able to induce the break using uh, the galactose inducible promoter, just adding a sugar to the medium to turn on the enzyme, make the cut, and then watch how this uh, repair event was going to take place. Okay. We got better at doing these gels over time. And here's what happens if you knock out RAD51. There's a basically no repair. You get the cut, but you don't see the repair because the RAD51 protein, just as it was necessary for those vertebrate cells that I showed you, is necessary here um, for yeast cells to do this repair. We also, we've looked at lots of other genes. Uh, one, yeast cells have an equivalent, to, but it's not identical in, at the protein level to the so-called BRCA2 protein, which is one of the hereditary breast cancer mutations that people are interested in in humans. And BRCA2 and, it's, and, and the proteins that do that kind of a job also cannot do this kind of repair. If, if, but they still make the break, but the, break, uh, the cells all die because they cannot do the repair. So now RAD51 is an essential protein because every cell has to, in order for any cell to live, it must be able to do the repair of one chromosome break. Okay, so there are lots and lots of steps in this process. We're not going to go through them all. Um, but we, we have been able to sort of go through and identify lots of different steps in this process. The key thing that is happening during this process is that after the break is made, the red sequences are going to be removed. And they're removed sequentially by enzymes, so-called exonucleases, that chew away one strand of DNA and then clip off the second strand of DNA. So the red sequences go away. And during this process, the end of the break on the other side gets chewed away again by these enzymes that chew away in a directional fashion, leaving a single strand of DNA. This is the piece of DNA that the RAD51 protein binds to. And the RAD51 protein makes a filament on this piece of DNA. And this machine, this protein DNA filament, has a remarkable property of being able to sort of crash all around the nucleus and, and, and interrogate other DNA sequences to find sequences which have the same base pairs. And, and at that point, it makes base pairs with the donor sequence and displaces initially uh, one strand that was originally in the donor, and then it copies that information out, and that information is then used to copy the second strand, and at the end of this process, the red sequences are gone, and we have a new copy of the blue sequences. And actually, we could show, um, those of you who know the, the famous experiment of Messelson and Stahl that showed that E. coli DNA replication was semi-conservative. They added heavy isotopes to the DNA and then followed what happened when they chased them, those heavy labeled cells and they showed that all the DNA at the first replication had one heavy strand and one new strand that was light. 
And so we did the same experiment, except all the DNA here is light, and all the DNA here is heavy, because this is not a semi-conservative replication process, but it is using this sequence as a template, but all the newly synthesized DNA um, is found in the recipient locus, and that will become uh, important in, in, a, in more detail. Just okay, so we're interested in what parts of the normal DNA replication machinery do you need to do this event? And the answer is you don't need nearly all of it. Uh, you do not, as it turns out, need any of the components of so-called lighting strand DNA synthesis, all alpha or primase, because it turns out you're only copying one strand at a time, and you never need the lagging strand component. So this is a very simple system of replication compared to the normal DNA replication. Um, so the question is then, how, how can we see this? How can we see the proteins in action in this system? We can see the DNA by southern blots and also by polymerase chain reaction assays. But now we want to sort of see what happens to the proteins. And so I'm going to focus on one step in this process that, that we have analyzed in a lot of detail. And that is, after this break is made, how do you assemble this RAD51 protein onto the DNA so that it can then go search for the partner and, 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 and facilitate this repair? And people working in, in biochemistry in vitro had suggested that the first step that happened was not the direct formation of this filament, but the binding of a different protein called RPA, or single-strand DNA binding protein, that would bind to this single-strand piece of DNA. Actually, it has the nice property of unkinking, or, or uh, making more straight the DNA so that it facilitated this uh, uh, formation of this filament. And so there was a lot of suggestions that this uh, RPA might precede the, this step. And then we also knew that the proteins uh, in this process that were not part of this filament, but were necessary to facilitate the removal of the RPA protein and, and the formation of this RAD51 filament. And a lot of this had been suggested by bio, very excellent biochemistry, both in E. coli, which has analogous proteins in the yeast. So the idea was to see if we could follow this in real time. And the strategy for doing this is something called chromatin immunoprecipitation. Um, it, it, it turns out that if you add formaldehyde to yeast cells or to mammalian cells, in a very short time, the formaldehyde cross-reacts in such a way that it links proteins to proteins and proteins to DNA uh, in a covalent fashion. And so you have uh, proteins now stuck onto the DNA. They can't come off anymore. And this is true for all sorts of different proteins. We're interested in the RAD51 protein, which is bound uh, to the mating type DNA <coughs> that has been recycled by this enzyme. So you then shear up the DNA into little pieces. You put it in a sonicator and bust it up. And then use an antibody that is specific for the protein you're interested in. In this case, an antibody that was directed against the RAD51 protein. And when you do this, you purify the RAD51 protein and any DNA to which it is attached. And then, in a kind of gift of the intelligent designer, uh, you raise the temperature to 60 degrees centigrade and all the cross links go away. Okay, so fantastically easy process to then, um, to then end up with the DNA no longer attached to the protein and, and then you can assay whether you have this piece of DNA or that piece or that piece of DNA by using polymerase chain reactions to amplify and study um, the, the, this particular piece of DNA. So we can ask when does the RAD51 protein become attached to this piece of DNA by when it is immunoprecipitated by this process. Okay, here's a warning. Um, this technique has been widely used, not simply by my lab, as you can imagine. And it turns out literally 100 proteins have been identified as binding to the end of the double strand braid. They're not all there at the same time. Okay, so another problem that we're still trying to deal with is the choreography. Which proteins get there first? What do they do? What ones are necessary for other ones to arrive? Um, how is this all sorted out? And you know, what's the, who is the the traffic cop, which is directing this traffic, but 
it is um, it, it is an amazingly powerful technique. Okay, and so this is what you get from such an experiment. Here at the bottom is the southern blot, but we've expanded the time here. And so what I can show you is that when we turn on the HO enzyme, in 20 minutes, essentially all the DNA has been cut. So that's, that's fantastic. It means it's very synchronous. And we can follow then what happens. And here's the appearance of the product. It still takes a very long time for the product to show up. Um, this is, again, for MAD A to MAD alpha. And now what we want to know is when can we detect the RAD51 protein bound to the MAT DNA. And that is illustrated here. And the conclusion that we drew from this is that RAD51 could be very robustly detected at 30 minutes. But that's interesting because at, tw at 20 minutes, all the DNA is already cut. And so one question is, is, it, is RAD51 unable to bind at this time because the nucleases that chew away the DNA haven't exposed this region because RAD51 only binds to single-stranded DNA? Or is it the case that before RAD51 is bound, there really is RPA bound. And so we did the same chip experiment, but now using an antibody against one of the subunits of RPA instead of using an antibody against RAD51. And sure enough, RAD RPA shows up as fast as we can do the break. So the notion is, as soon as there's a break, the enzymes attack it and start chewing away the DNA. But it is first indeed bound by RPA. And then in a, what is, at the chemical level, an incredibly slow step. It takes 10 minutes before we can see that the RAD51 protein has displaced uh, the RPA. And by the way, it's very interesting that and because even though this is a synchronous process, we never see a situation where all the RPA goes away and it's only a RAD51. It must be a very dynamic process. And, and these are aspects of this process that we haven't worked out. Now, it turned out that we got a, a, a kind of a bonus from this experiment, and that was that we realized that if we had chromatin immunoprecipitation that could detect when RAD51 was bound to the, to the DNA that was cut at MAT, if this search for the template was mediated by RAD51, there also should be a time when the RAD51 protein has helped this piece of DNA to base pair with the donor sequences, which it must do in order to carry out this repair process. And so we ought to be able to see how long after we have seen RAD51 down at MAP, we can see it find its, this donor sequence. And so we did that in exactly the same way. The only difference in this experiment, we're still using the same antibody, anti-RAD51 antibody, to pull down the DNA. But here we're asking for these sequences to be present. And here we're asking for these blue sequences to be present, and that's, and that's the difference. So it takes a long time. From the time that the end is exposed and is bound to the RAD51 machinery that is going to search around the genome for its partner, it takes real time in order to find that partner. And we've refined this, um, and I'll, I'll just summarize. I'm not going to show you a data for all of these things. But, but what we know is that after the cell has formed this recombinase filament, it takes roughly 15 minutes for it to find its partner. And then, in another assay that I'm not going to show you, uh, I mean, well, I'm, I'll just tell you about. We use this polymerase chain reaction trick to use a primer sequence, which is specific for the donor, and another primer sequence, which is specific for that. Initially, these are 200 kilobases apart on the DNA. So you're not going to get a PCR amplification process, even if you use very good polymerase. Um, but as soon as the invasion has taken place and DNA polymerase starts to copy the information that it needs to copy to do this repair, as soon as 50 base pairs of new DNA sequences have been made, now this PCR primer and this PCR primer are linked by an intermediate of, of repair and we get the appearance of the product. And, I, and I'll just show you uh, one example of this. So we were very, we've done this for lots of mutants. Um, this is another mutant that is necessary for the completion of this repair process. And what we could show with this mutant is that by chip, the RAD51 protein could go to the donor locus. It can do this step, but it can't do the next step. Okay, so here 
uh, the new DNA synthesis happens, and this is what we see for the, for the wild type sequence, that the mutant can't do the amplification. So this protein, which is a so-called chromatin remodeler, which somehow moves nucleosomes around on DNA, is necessary in order to carry out the new DNA synthesis step, but is not necessary for the strand invasion step. And that's the kind of level of detail that we can get out of doing these kinds of experiments. So um, what I want to then turn to is, is, is a little bit more of sort of where we have gone from this point. Um, and, and one of the things that, uh, that we were very influenced by was this very important paper published in, 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 in about 2007 or 8 by, by these three guys in science. And they were trying to explain why cancer cells have all those chromosome rearrangements. And they made a very interesting discovery, and that was that cells, precancerous cells and cancerous cells, that have these activated oncogenes, the mutations that turn these genes into having novel functions, cause, surprisingly enough, the stalling and collapse of DNA replication forms. So they actually, these cancer-causing mutations are actually causing more chromosomal aberrations by making the DNA replication more difficult. And they argued that this led in, to the formation of breaks, and that this breaks would then contribute to this genome stability. And, and I think what we have been studying is a way of, of looking at how those repair processes go, go ahead. But we want to add something more to this, and that is that the cause that these double-strand breaks not only cause chromosomal rearrangement, but it turns out that, that there is a, a, a remarkable increase in the rate of mutations, small changes in the DNA, that is associated with the repair process. So although the repair process is necessary to put the DNA together in a way so that you don't have all those crazy translocations, it comes at a cost. And the cost is an elevated level of mutation, which may contribute to the need to have all these different uh, kinds of mutations in a very small number of cell divisions. And so um, I'm going to tell you the, 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 the conclusion, then I'll show you how we found some of these uh, events. So this is a cartoon of just the replacement of the red sequences by the blue sequences. And what I'm going to tell you is that the rate of mutation in these sequences is a thousand times higher than the rate you would just get by doing normal DNA replication. And that many of these mutations have what I'll call a signature. And the signature is that the DNA polymerase copying these regions is frequently falling off and getting back on and getting back on in, a bad, in an inaccurate way, what is called template switching. Okay, so how did we do this? We tricked up the system that we had been using. I didn't quite tell you the whole story about mating type switching. It has actually two different donors. Now we're talking about the other one. It's not important. We replaced the mating type sequences here with a functional copy of a uracil-3 gene, which is necessary for cells to grow without uracil in the medium. Except it isn't expressed. And it's not expressed because, as I told you, these silent loci are heterochromatic, and a perfectly nice gene is not expressed because it's silent. And so now we make a break, and the cell copies this information into the, into the mat locus. Now the cells are uroplus. They don't need uracil in the medium because this is, gene is now expressed. Okay. And so we could look for rare, and they were rare, mutations um, that, were, uh, that were uracil minus. And that's what we think, what we thought we would be looking at, and what we are looking at, is our mutations that have arisen during the copying process. But to show that, we unsilenced, oops, I don't have we unsilence the silent locus by a chemical trick. If you interfere with the silencing process, which requires a, 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 a nicotinamid, a, a NAD-dependent histone deacetylase, by adding nicotinamid to the medium, now this locus becomes uh, no, unsilent, and the cells go back to being your plus, because this copy is wild type. And that means that all the mutations I'm going to tell you about happen <coughs> for sure during the process of copying during this DNA repair process. And that was critical because we didn't want to, we didn't want to worry about mutations that had pre-existed here that would jump into this location. And so we sequenced lots of these things. 
you know, when I started in my career, there was zero DNA sequencing. Okay, I was already a full professor before there was DNA sequencing. Okay, and and then it was hard. Now now you just send them out; they come back the next day. So you can sequence lots and lots of mutations. The, the mutations above the line represent base pair substitutions. The black ones represent uh, the nonsense codons, chain terminating mutations, which are which are there in large number. The ones below the line are um, are um, changes in the DNA sequence, uh, deletions or things like deletions. And it turns out that what was striking at the beginning was that we had this whole class of mutations that had lost a single base. And interestingly, if you look at the sequence, here are four Gs becomes three Gs. Here's four Cs become, oops. Here's four Cs become three Cs. Um, there were some other deletions. This is, this is a jump where there's seven base pairs here, and all of this sequence was deleted because the same seven base pairs are here. It's some kind of copying error. And in fact, um, next slide, is this is the most frequent errors that medieval monks in Europe made while copying the Bible. Okay? There are errors of copying in which um, somebody comes into the room and says, did you hear about the, the abbot? He fell down the stairs, ha, 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 you know, they talk. And then the guy goes back to finish copying. And he says, where was I? I was copying the word holy. And it's supposed to be one, two, three, but he ends up with two. Okay. It's exactly what's going on at the DNA level. You have four Gs becoming three Gs because the copying machinery falls off and can't remember where it ought to be. And there's actually a technical term for this in the, in, for the people who study these medieval manuscripts um, because it happens so frequently. And that's exactly what's happening in, in these sequences. So that's what, uh, th those were the, the majority of the, of the mutations that we saw. But then there were two classes that we imaginatively called weird and totally weird events that, that I want to tell you about because they are the more interesting events. The weird ones um, both have base pair substitutions and changes, deletions or insertions into the sequence. And they all turn out to be events that are so hard to imagine how, why the cell would ever allow this to happen. But here, the DNA is being copied from the template. It appears to fall off and to, and to comp make base pairs with itself. And then it starts copying itself, and then everything uncrucifies, and you get back to the same sequence. And it turns out that you end up with these crazy events, which are both base pair substitutions and insertions. And they've been seen for a long time. Lynn Ripley was the first pe person to see them. But these are called quasi-palindrome events. And they turn out to be ev also evidence that the machinery copying the DNA gets distracted, falls off, and then does this crazy thing um, in order to do the, the rest of the repair. And, and it turns out that if you look in the P53 tumor database, there are lots of examples of this. They were originally attributed to a different, something called mismatch repair defects, but we think that they're actually copied. And then finally, um, uh, and I'll just say one more thing. So, so, so in the modern era, the era that you now live in, is that you can now take cancer cells and you can do deep sequencing on them and you can get out incredible amounts of information by being able to determine the whole genome sequence. In this case, they had s samples of breast cancers that, that from the normal all the way to the full-blown cancer, and they, and they could describe many of these different things. These are huge uh, enterprises, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad that my lab is not so big because you, I'd hate to be this woman, you know, and say this is my paper, right? <laughs> which, which you would call et al. Davies et al. Okay, so, um, so they take a lot of work, but so in yeast, what do we do? We provide the model for this. So this is a quote from that paper: If a stochastic event in the nucleus results in a DNA break. Repair of this break is associated with the accumulation of substitutions in the, in the vicinity of the rearrangement. This could provide an, an explanation for the targeting of mutation clusters. Indeed, such mechanisms have been reported. Um, um, 
okay, so what's this paper? That's the paper I've just been talking about. So we provided the model for these kinds of mutational events in, in, in million cells. And, and, and that's the value of doing this model system kind of work. Um, I have two more minutes. Um, okay, so then finally there were the very weird or totally weird events. And they had DNA sequences that don't come from the uracil 3 gene. Okay, so that was not expected. Um, and, we, and we asked where they came from, and it turns out they actually come from a different location on a completely different chromosome. Okay, so this is a copy of the uracil 3 gene, and I didn't tell you this before, but we, it, it comes from a different yeast called Cloibromyces lactis. This copy is only 71% identical to this copy. Nevertheless, and it's, and it's inactive because of a, a retrotransposome insertion. And much to our surprise, we, we pretty sure we know this now, during this copying process, the, the copied DNA must fall off, go to a completely different chromosome, copy some of that information, and then has to go all the way back because we don't get any events out of this unless it jumps back to the original template. So this involves not one, but two jumps, and the jumps are not little jumps losing a G or, or those quasi-palindromes. These are jumps to a completely different chromosome. And there's a big lesson in this, and here's the lesson. The finding these events required us to be both lazy and lucky. Why lazy? Because we called up Jasper Ryan's lab, because he had already put the urethroid gene from lactis in the HMR locus, which is what we wanted to do. So why would we bother doing it again? We called Jasper, we cloned by phone, as, as this is called, and he sent us the sequence and we used it. So that was lazy. And we also didn't, we knew that the, the, the Cerevisiae had a copy, an inactive copy of the uracil 3 gene that's only 71% identical, and we didn't delete it. And we didn't delete it because we figured it wouldn't, it wouldn't be involved. So that was lazy or arrogant or something. <laughs> and then we were lucky. And the lucky is that it turns out that if you just jump from this gene to this gene, they're all Europlus. Because the, the, although the protein sequences are divergent, all the chimeric proteins are functional. So how did we get out of Euro-minus, which is the way we selected for these things? And it turns out that every jump that we initially recovered either began or ended with the same five base pair sequence. And it turns out that this five base pair sequence involves the same three amino acid codons, but just by chance, those five nucleotides represent, are out of frame with each other. Okay, so every event either started or ended there because we had to get a frame shift in order to get a Euro minus product. So we were unbelievably lucky. Okay, if the sequence hadn't existed, and there was no guarantee it would, we wouldn't have found these events even though they were there. Okay, so, we, I was saying at lunch, luck is, it's not all luck. You have to have a prepared mind to see the event. That's the, that's the, that's how luck really works in science. It's not that you just, you know, you just see something. You have to know, you have to know that what you've seen is interesting. And that's, that's what we focused on. So now, very recently, I'm just going to finish up by saying, so, so a postdoc came to the lab, Olga Zeppelina, in order to study these template jumps from one chromosome to another. This is a drawing done by my granddaughter, um, <laughs> which we submitted to molecular cell, but they didn't use it as the cover. <laughs> if you go see the cover they use, it's terrible. <laughs> so Olga decided to study these events in detail, so she did a very cute trick. She deleted 32 base pairs from this template. So now it's your minus no matter what happens. If it jumps in here, it's still your minus because it's mutant. So the only way it can become your plus is to do this pair of jumps to pick up at least 32 base pairs of sequence so that when it finally ends up here, you end up with a chimeric gene and it's functional. So everything that Olga picks up is, is, is this two jump system. So now out of all the crazy events, we, we, we're down to this one. We also have now started, we've invented a way to put a, 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 a particular quasi-palindrome into this sequence 
So then only if the quasi palindrome is repaired will you get this thing. So we're going to do the same kind of trick that we did with the deletion uh, with the quasi palindromes. And, and so we learned a lot from this. One was that people, when we first published this work, people said, well, maybe the reason you're getting such a large number of jumps is that when the DNA polymerase comes in here, it has to fight through all these organized nucleosomes because this region is silent. And so now we can unsilence the region because it, it's going to be your or minus whether it's silent or not. It made no difference whatsoever. So that the errors of this copying machinery are not being promoted by the chromatin structure of the donor locus. That was important for us to know. Um, we, we know. We know how much DNA is copied. Um, it's not all the same amount. And it's really fascinating. If you look for one jump, so the idea is it has to jump from one side of the deletion to the other side of the deletion. So this is one place where the sequence jumps into the, the uracil uh, sequence on the other chromosome. And these are all the places it jumps back. And the point is, they're not uniform. Okay? There are many places where this event can happen. And, and when we sort of looked at all of them, these, indeed, some of these sequences, the longest shared homology between uracil-3 of Saccharomyces and Clavermyces, some of the longest sequences were used enormously frequently. But if you look through this, you'll discover that this, this sequence, which is as long as this sequence, hardly used at all. So there, we don't understand all the rules. It's not just bigger is not, is not always better in this jump thing. And we have to figure out exactly what are the rules for this jumping. And then the second thing that we could do that Olga did um, was everything we had done was with this 71% identical sequence. So the question was, if we now make these sequences identical, how much better will the jumping be? And the answer is 10,000 times better. Okay, now what does this mean? It means that roughly one in 300 repair events has done two jumps. And that means this is amazingly unstable. So if you want to, so this is an, uh, an accurate repair process which is intrinsically not very accurate. The DNA polymerases, which are not like a normal replication fork, are falling off and getting back on at a very, very high rate. And, and that's <coughs> something I don't think we appreciated until we had done this experiment. So that, that's, uh, okay, so, so this is just summarizing what those events are. Again, so that the, the, the broken DNA invades into the template, starts copying, but falls off, goes to a completely different chromosome, copies some more, jumps back, and then eventually puts this all at, the, at this event and happens at this very high rate. So I want to spend just a few more minutes telling you about one other thing, and that is a phenomenon that we didn't even know existed until 2011. So this is called chromothripsis, which is a Greek uh, phrase meaning chromosome shattering. And what people discovered is that in some cancer cells, several percent of cancer cells, a, a single chromosome will get completely smashed and reassembled in some scrambled fashion. How this happens is a mystery. Um, um, okay, so no, how, why didn't we know this happened? Because the staining will show you a translocation, but if there are lots of rearrangements of this chromosome, you won't see them because they're all purple. Okay, so it was only when there was deep, deep sequencing where you could really get the sequence uh, in, high co in high coverage of individual chromosomes could you see that this had happened. And Peter Campbell's lab was the first to find this, did not publish this until 2011. So we're talking about something we just didn't know about until a couple of years ago. And, and, and this is just a, a, a figure for this paper where, where this is one chromosome just being completely bashed into all these rearrangements. And some of these rearrangements probably have something to do with the cancer, and many others are just the consequence of the bashing that we don't yet understand. But I, I, just to put this in a framework, any, have any of you read this book? Um, yeah. It's an interesting book about the origin of the so-called HeLa cells, which were actually derived from, from this a tumor from this woman named Henrietta Lacks. And Henrietta Lacks's cells have been used by more labs than any other cell line. And nobody 
knew what the basis of the cancer was in her in the cell line. So last year, um, two labs sequenced the, the genome of the HeLa cells. And, and it turns out there are, of course, mutations on every chromosome. But one chromosome, and only one, has this massive rearrangement. And it turns out that right here, in one of those massive rearrangements, is in a, pr a particularly important tumor suppressor gene. That may or may not be the, the origin of the original cancer. For all we know that she had a cancer where this was a very late event. We, we have no idea about the history of her, of her cancer. But it is really fascinating that one chromosome in, in the HeLa cells has this chromothripsis uh, rearrangement. So people have tried to figure out models for how this might happen. And the I one idea is that DNA copying just jumps from random place to random place to, to end up with these hybrid sequences. That can't be the whole story, but it seems to be part of it. And so what I'll just leave you with is that we decided we could, we could do something to model this. It's a very crude model because we're not making hundreds of rearrangements. And so we again use the HON denuclease. And here is part of the uracil 3 gene. And here's the middle part. And here's the last part. R overlaps with R. There are 300 base pairs of identical sequence here, or not identical because we could make these divergent. And then A goes to A. So if all this works, the break invades and copies, and then jumps and copies, and you end up, voila, with Uracil 3, which we can select for. So we've, we've been doing a lot of this. I'm not going to show you all the data or any of these data except to say that one of the things we got interested in was what would happen if we made this process go the wrong way. This cell can't possibly survive without these sequences. So if it's copying this way, what's going to happen? And it turns out it gets to about here, where it finds a set of repeated sequences, and then jumps somewhere else, and then jumps again somewhere else. And you get these highly complex rearrangements that come out, which are very reminiscent of what you see in cancer cells. In fact, Jim Lupsky's lab had published just about the same time that these, that these, that the, that these events were called in, inverted genomic segments and triplication rearrangements mediated by inverted repeats in the human genome. That's exactly what we have in yeast. And so we have a real nice model now for the kind of events that Lupsky's lab is interested in in tumor cells, which we can beat to death in yeast because we can look at all the mutations, what, what, what genes are necessary for this to happen, and so forth. And that's, that's what, we, what we do. So um, this is. Uh, not quite the most recent picture of my lab and a list of the people in my lab. We get a huge amount of support from the National Institutes of Health. Um, if you like this stuff, you could buy my book, <laughs> um, which was published last year. And, uh, <laughs> A few questions and then we can move on to the reception and ask more questions. So, questions, please. Please. Okay, so uh, after the double strain break and uh, a single strain uh, DNA is exposed, yes. uh, so my question is generally, how long is this single strain DNA? And is that possible the longer the single strain DNA is and the higher specificity it can achieve in the next state of searching the donor sequence? Well, uh, okay, so I have to answer it in two pieces. Um, the, the, the rate of, of resection is one nucleotide per second. Uh, so very slow compared to DNA polymerase, which would be going 400 nucleotides a second, for example, or more. Um, so the resection is slow. Um, the filament seems to have a limited size, uh, uh, so the more resection does not guarantee that it is going to be more efficient, especially in this situation. Actually, the mating type system that I talked about only has 300 base pairs of homology in the region that is undergoing recombination. So if it keeps resecting further, it's, it's not going to help. It, it may, in fact, expose other sequences that can do some of these crazy events um, elsewhere in the genome and actually make the repair efficiency go down. 
So, so, uh, but but if we if we prevent the repair event in a Rad 51 mutant, or if we delete the donor sequences so that the break is made, we can watch this resection and it will go for 24 hours. Okay, so in 24 hours you have roughly uh, uh, I, I don't know, 24 kb. Well, it's 4 kb an hour, so. You have 96 kb of DNA being resected, and we can show that the resection is still going on. I don't, that doesn't, of course, happen when the repair event can take place. And there, I think what happens is that the resection is very stupid. It just keeps going, but the DNA polymerase comes and fashion gets to the end and just stops it. But, but there is no advantage to doing longer and longer and longer, at least in this situation. If you talk about between two chromosomes, which are homologs to each other, of course, you may make things more efficient by going longer because you, the, the, the broken chromosome and the intact chromosome are sharing uh, the same sequence or almost the same sequence for, for hundreds of kilobases. But in fact, these repair events don't require more than a few hundred base pairs of homology. So uh, I think you remember, you, you, you say there's a, a two minutes gap between yes. uh, after the break and the um, before the the the, the, the rat fit one by uh, yes. assembled on two, so this ten minute ten minutes is not for generate a, a long end. No, I don't think so. It's it's somehow the time it takes to for the RPA protein to be replaced by the rat fifty one protein. Okay. And apparently the rat the RPA protein, as soon as there is single stranded DNA, there there must be a very high affinity for single-stranded DNA. There is five foot by the single-stranded DNA binding protein. And it gets there first and binds and can only be removed by the help of some of these other enzymes. The BRCA2 enzyme in mammalian cells is necessary to push the RPA off and put RAD51 in its place. Yeah. What do you think is the molecular basis for the high frequency of mutation in the stretch of the homo, homo polymer. Um, it turns out that it is the wild type DNA polymerase delta. Uh, I didn't put these data in. So we, we started making mutations or using mutations in the different DNA polymerases to know which DNA polymerase was causing this problem. And so we used a, uh, a proofreading defective mutation of DNA polymerase delta thinking that we would make the events perhaps go even more of these events. And we got the incredibly surprising result that they went away. Okay. So you get many more base pair substitutions, which is not surprising because the polymerase doesn't have its proofreading. But these, the, the, the four base pairs going to three, or these crazy jumps, almost all of them go away in the proofreading mutation. So, um, Dimitri Gordinian and Peter Bergers had an in vitro experiment. Here's a piece of DNA and another piece of DNA, which is a primer. And they called this the blocking oligonucleotide. And so here, polymerase gets on and it copies. And when it gets to here, it stops. That's what the wild type enzyme does. The proofreading defective enzyme goes all the way to the end. And the, and the conclusion was, if you think about what proofreading means, every time DNA polymerase adds a base, it then totally rearranges itself and does proofreading, which requires a big conformational change of the polymerase in order to go from the active site to the exonuclease site and back. The proofreading defective enzyme apparently doesn't do the rearrangement. And so it is more processive. It makes more base pair substitutions. But apparently, that the wild type enzyme's lack of processivity is what is responsible for these, for these, these unstable uh, events that we see. That was very surprising to us, that it was not a mutant. It's the wild type, which is the source of these. Right? So then how does it compare to a regular it's, it's a thousand times higher rate. Right, but the same polymerase. But the polymerase is, in, 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 a, in normal replication, you have leading and lagging synthesis. Everything is in a fork. There are proteins bridging the two sides of the fork. 
and everything is moving in a coordinated fashion um, with MCM protein, the CCM helicase. These short patch events do not require MCM or, 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 or CDC45 or, or, or GINS proteins. So the, the long things, the things that I talked about, which are jumping this, this from here to here to here to make Euro 3, they require everything. All alpha, Paul delta, Paul epsilon, everything. But these short patch events, which first go this way and then go this way, don't need all of these components, and those components must help to make the replication fork much more stable. That's the basis. That's what I think is the basis. Yes? Yeah. Um, the two jumping repair that you observe in your lazy and lucky experiment. Yeah. I wonder whether it's uh, appropriate to describe as a non-allelic uh, Yes, absolutely non-allelic. I, I think it's a perfectly good model for non-allelic recombination that people describe in cancer cells. Absolutely. And it doesn't require 100% homologous. No, in so fact, it requires, uh, so, I mean, at, at much lower levels, it, it, it does not require more than 71%. That, uh, maybe higher similarity, maybe more favorable. Yes, because as I said, just to repeat, when we made the sequences identical, we got a 10,000-fold increase in the rate. So indeed, the level of mismatch is a barrier to these events, but not enough to prevent them. And for this jumping part, does it matter where this uh, harmonic sequence is located on the chromosome? Uh, what happens if we, we uh, so far all we have done is move it back to the same chromosome from, so that all the jumps are now in the same chromosome rather than jump into a different one. The rate went up threefold, but not thirtyfold or a hundredfold. So it seems to be able to jump anywhere in the genome, but we have not measured many, well, we have measured only one site. And it would be very interesting to measure more. Um, and also what we would like to know is how often how often will it jump to sequences that really have no no real homology. In other words, we're, what I showed you in that, in that pattern was that we have two base pairs of homology here and six base pairs of homology here jumped in here it goes out there. Is that all you really need is two and six? Well that you should be able to find many many places in the genome. And we have yet not seen that. So I think it means that, that th there's a problem in how, as a, as a group, we describe these events. We call them microhomology mediated, and we describe them by the number of base pairs at exactly the junction. But I think they must be using more of the adjacent DNA as part of the way in which they are aligning themselves, because we don't see them jump just to this two base pair sequence and and 500 base pairs later to leave by another five base pair sequence. So we're doing that experiment. We have deleted the thing we should have done if we had been not so lazy. We deleted the copy of, chroma, of the uracil on the other chromosome. And we are still asking for mutations to occur. And the only way they should occur is if it can jump just into anything. And we'll, we'll see. So far, we, we've got a nice system. We now know it works, but we don't have a, we don't know if we have any real events. But that I think we should know by the time I come back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I uh, we will be having a reception outside. So let's thank uh, Professor Haber for a wonderful. <laughs>